It's a, it's a great honor to meet with you today, and for the next 49 minutes, we're going to go on a full-speed road trip to the 1950s, the book Questions on Doctrine, the question of original sin. We're going to engage in a study of what the Bible teaches about what sin is, and we're going to analyze at the end where we stand today. So, let's begin. I'd like to put on the screen an excerpt from the present fundamental belief statements of the of statement of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Uh, this comes from the uh, number seven belief, the nature of man, and we've excerpted this, so take a look at this. I'll read it for you also. When our first parents disobeyed God, they denied their dependence upon him and fell from their high position under God. The image of God in them was marred, and they became subject to death. Their descendants shared this fallen nature and its consequences. They are born with weaknesses and tendencies to evil. So this statement was voted in 19, 1980 at the General Conference session, and I want you to notice that it says that we are, it, it does not say that we're born condemned. It says that we're born with weaknesses and tendencies to evil. We're not born guilty. Weaknesses and tendencies to evil. So we're going to come back to this at the close of this presentation, but just keep that, keep your brain, put your brain thumb on that because we're coming back to that. So uh, let's venture back now, further back to 1980, and let's go all the way back to the 1950s. In 1955, the first of 18 uh, presentations, 18 meetings were held between Evangelicals and Seventh-day and Seventh Adventists. Um, the outgrowth of these meetings was the book, Questions on Doctrine. The actual title was Seventh-day Adventist Answer Questions on Doctrine, and it became known unaffectionately ever since as QOD. I actually have two copies of this. I have this one, and as I was walking into the parking lot today, the, the cover came off. Um, maybe an, an omen for this talk, I don't know. So uh, this is the book. It's, it came out of these meetings, and this book is the most uh, widely acknowledged uh, as being the most divisive book that's ever happened in the Seventh-day Adventist uh, publication history, history of anything we've ever published. So, questions on doctrine. Walter Martin was an up-and-coming evangelical researcher. His specialty was cults. He wrote books about cults, and he was in the process of investigating Seventh-day Adventists. His associates included Donald Gray Barnhouse, he was a Presbyterian minister and the editor of Eternity magazine. There was uh, George E. Cannon, New Testament theology professor specializing in, in biblical languages. And uh, Martin was planning a new book on Adventists. So there was every reason to anticipate that this new book would reinforce and reestablish the idea that Seventh-day Adventists were a cult. Now, in the process of his research, Martin approached Adventist leaders with certain questions he wanted to ask us. Now, on the Adventist side, Leroy Froome saw Martin's inquiry as an opportunity to extract the Adventist church from the cult category. Sounds like a good thing, right? Well, now, face-to-face -face meetings were arranged, and uh, they were held on March 8 through 10 in 1955 at the General Conference headquarters. So the Adventists who met were T.E. Unruh, uh, conference president, Walter E. Reed, he was a soft-spoken general conference field secretary, Leroy Edwin Froome, he was a researcher, historian, he was a seminary professor, and I want to say this in a nice way, but he was kind of an aggressive personality. Uh, present unofficially, it looks like, was Roy Allen Anderson. He was an evangelist by background, and he was serving as the leader of the Ministerial Association of the General Conference. Martin came uh, armed with a formidable battery of hostile and slanted questions, and he discharged them in rapid-fire style, asking these questions of the Adventists. What troubled Martin and his group the most was the question about Adventist teaching on the nature of Christ. That was their big concern. And some of this was a concern about Jesus' deity. Is Jesus really God? Did he have a beginning? Whatever. Uh, the other question was about the nature of his humanity. This really bothered the evangelicals. So among Martin's most pointed questioning was this issue about the nature of Christ. And I want you to know that in this book, or what, what's left of it there, this book is, a lot of the content in the book is, is the Adventist answers to these questions. So now after Martin had, had presented his questions, this is the first meeting they held, the Adventists shared, shared with uh, their own careful statements that they had prepared beforehand, and they came back and gave those in response. And do you know what? The Adventist material really surprised the evangelicals. Uh, 
and they all decided they would share their questions and they would put it in writing and share it back and forth through the rest of the meetings. So as the day wore on, here's what happened. Martin and Cannon were given a stack of books uh, to substantiate the claims the Adventists made. And meanwhile, Froome and the Adventist consulted together and Froome sat down in his office and he wrote almost two dozen pages on his typewriter, or he wrote it out perhaps, and then his secretary actually typed it out. And the uh, evangelicals were given those notes that same evening and they went back to their motel room and so then I'm going to tell you what happened the next day. I'm quoting from a book um, from Julius Nam, and he's rec recounting some material from Roy Allen Anderson. I'll just read it to you from Nam's book. Here's what happened the next day. When the two parties returned to the general conference meeting the following day, Wednesday, March 9, Martin made a dramatic announcement that shocked the Adventist conferees and permanently changed the nature of the relationship between Adventists and Evangelicals. He and Cannon had pored over the documents given to them and reflected on the discussions of the previous day until 2 a.m. As a result, they had concluded that they had been wrong in their past assessment of Seventh-day Adventism Martin said, quote, while we did not expect things would turn out this way, we are now prepared to say, you folk are not heretics as we thought, but rather redeemed brethren in Christ. With this newfound conviction, Martin stood in stark contrast not only to his own earlier writings, but also to the entire evangelical world. He made it clear that he now believed that Adventists who believed, as did the conferees, were truly born-again Christians, born again Christians and his brethren in Christ. And then, in a dramatic gesture, he extended his hand in fellowship. You need to be careful sometimes about shaking hands. Amen. These meetings were just beginning. Challenges remained, but we catch the flavor. Change was in the air. Now, in the weeks and months that followed, uh, Froome sent numerous letters to GC President Ruben Figur uh, outlining these developments. He insisted that Adventists must place the gospel, quote, the gospel is shared with the evangelical world uh, prominently in the presentations of the Adventist message. Uh, as as uh, T.E. Unruh, Unruh tells it, quote, the evangelicals helped Adventist leaders express their beliefs in terms more easily understood by theologians of other communions. In these communicating, communications from Froome, he, Froome said this, quote, or Nam says this, Froome implied that many Adventist leaders supported the idea of a sinful nature of Christ without understanding all its implications due to imprecise theological thinking and lack of experience in communicating with other Christians. So, unquote. So that is, Froome had largely bought into certain essential features of the evangelical gospel. He thought that really these things were right, and he wanted Adventists to express Adventist teachings according to ways that would be able to be easily understood by other Christian people. And so, uh, key implications concerning the humanity of Jesus in the evangelical world, he must not have a fallen humanity. The atonement, atonement must be completed on the cross. This is what they were looking for, and that's what was delivered to them. Uh, along with these inevitable accompanying understandings of sin, hum fallen human nature itself is really considered to be guilty in many of these understandings of sin. So these are were points that Froome seems to have adopted and accepted, and he urgently sought to have these promoted by Adventists. And for, for the years following the questions on doctrine, uh, these count, uh, meetings and the book release, this was pressed and pressed and pressed through ministry magazine and sources into the Adventist church, pressing these ideas that we need to do this. And the Adventist ministers were getting a kind of a continual onslaught of this uh, approach about this. But you know what's interesting is that theologically these Adventists were in over their heads. If you read Herbert Douglas, A Fork in the Road, he makes his point several times and I believe he's right. These, they were not, the Adventists were not the theolog theologians that the evangelicals were. You can have an excellent understanding of theology, but still have a wrong theology. And these evangelicals had a very good understanding of how pieces interlock, how the doctrines lock and fit together in an interlocking way. But you know what, on the Adventist side, we didn't, our people really weren't that way. They weren't good in systematics. Froome was brilliant in history, but Froome was not a systematic theologian. The evangelicals, as flawed though their understanding was, had a stronger grasp of how these ideas all come together. Martin could see how the pieces fit together. But if the, the Adventists were in an interesting place here, if they adopted certain points of understanding, you see other points are logically connected with those points. And they might not be altogether apparent, or maybe they are apparent and they want to push them anyway. So this is where things were left. To invite these evangelicals to help and explain our theology, I believe, was a dangerous move.
Don't you think that could be a dangerous move? Why don't we explain our theology? The church would pay dearly because of the Adventist party's confidence in their own competence. And that's a risk for us today. Froome, Reed, and Anderson represented a new guard. These were the authors of, of QOD. They represented the new guard, but the new guard wasn't up to the task. As, as, as brilliant as these people were, they weren't brilliant enough for this. The church's strongest systematic theologian, a man named M. L. Andreasen, had retired shortly before this, and the Froome group was very intentional about keeping Andreasen out of the loop, and they also wanted to keep F. D. Nicole out of the picture. Froome wrote that uh, F. D. Nicole was too sharp, so we don't want him involved. So here's a small group of men pushing and pushing hard as, as it develops here. Some people, by the way, have represented Andreasen as a cranky old pastor, but Andreasen had spent his life in advancing the work of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. He was a pastor, but not only a pastor, he was a president of conferences, he was a president of colleges. He became the most widely read Adventist author of his era. His books are sold in the ABC today, they're fantastic books. Uh, Hebrews, the book of Hebrews by Andreasen came out in 1948. He was at the top of his game. Brilliant. And in Hebrews, what's he dealing a lot with? The atonement and the humanity of Jesus. This was, this was, the ink was hardly still dry on this at this time. Uh, in the last decade of, of uh, Andreessen's professional life he, life, he served as field secretary for the General Conference, M. L. Andreessen, our best systematic theologian, set aside at this crucial time. He was a link between eras. As a younger man, Andreessen had spoken in, in, with Ellen White, but the, the 1950s marked a troubling new period for the Adventist Church and so Andreasen is set to the side during this time. Well, the result of the conferences the Adventist had begun in 1955 was the book QOD. There's much to say about QOD that is actually good. It's well written, it assembles a wealth of historical sources, it's positive, it makes a useful contribution in a lot of ways. But it also stands as the most aggressive attempt at theological revision ever made in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I thought about that before I made that statement. The most aggressive attempt. Even Desmond Ford's teaching wasn't so far reaching. Dramatic changes were attempted in QOD. QOD was uh, quite something. QOD really made the parking space. Desmond Ford later, you know, he's the one that first one to pull into the parking space. QOD prepared the way. Well, what about these changes in QOD? There's three areas that stand out. So one is the atonement. The Atonement. Questions on doctrine presented a slanted view of what Seventh-day Adventists believed on the Atonement. In opportunity of, this, opportunity of the Century, Herbert Douglas's little booklet, he wrote this. The general emphasis in there, in QOD's answer, unnecessarily through the center of gravity onto the cross, thus minimizing the equally essential role of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary, even though it may not have been their intent. And further on down, uh, and, uh, Douglas says this, Andreasen was wary about Calvinism's limited gospel which focused on Christ's atonement ministry primarily on the cross. He feared that the Adventist twin focus on Christ's atonement ministry on the cross and the heavenly sanctuary was being muted, unquote. In my estimation, Andreasen was absolutely spot on. In 1956, you know, what about this, uh, Andreasen's concerns? Were they valid? In 1956, the, uh, this Donald Gray Barnhouse, who participated in the meetings in, in, with the Adventists, with Martin, he, he, um, he responded to a letter written by R.A. Grieve, who had just been released from the uh, Adventist Conference in Australia. He was an Adventist pastor who stopped being an Adventist pastor about that time. And, and Barnhouse wrote this interesting response to it. I thought you might be interested in it. Here's what uh, Barnhouse said, the evangelical Barnhouse who met with the Adventists, here's what he says now to grieve in response. Listen, the whole doctrine of the sanctuary and the investigative judgment have undergone recasting and reinterpretation in Adventist theology within the last few years. And in the new definite volume, and he had a name for the book that finally became QOD, uh, he says these reinterpretations are rather plainly evident that was Barnhouse's view. What about Walter Martin? In his 1965 book, Kingdom of the Cults, Walter Martin wrote this. The Adventism of 1965 is different in not a few places from the Adventism of 1845 
And with that change, the necessity of reevaluation comes naturally. And he went on down to say, uh, on page 365 of Kingdom of the Cults, in recent years, however, there has been a definite movement toward more explicit declaration of belief in the principles of the Christian faith and the tenets of Christian theology. In short, and he puts this in quote marks, clarification and redefinition have characterized recent Seventh-day Adventist theological activities. That was Martin's analysis in 1965. Interesting, but you know, this isn't the way the question of the atonement had been represented in QOD. This isn't the way the book QOD had represented what had happened. They said, we haven't changed anything. We've just reworded it a little bit. But the evangelicals weren't fooled. And there were some Adventists that weren't fooled either. The evangelicals saw clearly what had happened. And that's why he put quote marks on redefinition and re and in clarification. So there's three things we mentioned in QOD. The atonement question. The nature of Christ is the next one. On the nature of Christ, QOD sought to change the direction of our, of our view about 180 degrees. Um, I'd say that's a pretty fair statement. The attempted shift was away from Jesus having the nature of Adam after the fall to his having the nature of Adam before the fall. That's 180 degrees, isn't it? The centerpiece of this attempt to change the Adventist view on Christ's nature was a compilation of Ellen White's statements stripped of context and framed so as to give an opposite testimony and then published in the appendix in the back of, of this wonderful book right here, QOD. Douglas remembers it on page 43 and 44 of our little booklet, Opportunity of the Century, quote, As associate editor of the Review and Herald, I had the luxury of research in the publishing house's magnificent library. I began to read the context of each of QOD's statements that seemed to be cherry-picked by someone who tried to emphasize a certain point of view. One by one I would bring these statements to Kenneth H. Wood, editor-in-chief, and we stared with amazement at someone's remarkable disregard for context. This collection of tampered quotations became ever since the armament factory for teachers and pastors and authors who relied on this collection for their understanding of Christ's human nature, thus missing the big picture." Unquote. So that's two of the three. There's a third area that's more subtle, but it also represents significant attempted change in the Adventist understandings that are set forth in QOD, and it's the doctrine of sin. Sin. Edwin Zacherson, former Seventh-day Adventist theology professor, and I, I believe he's not an Adventist today, but he had taught theology in some of our uh, colleges. He points to a statement, uh, Jeffrey Paxton's observation, I quote Zacherson, talking about Zacherson. Here's what he says, quote, Jeffrey Paxton, an Anglican observer of Adventism, has asserted that in the church's history, the doctrine, he's talking about the doctrine of original sin, in the church's history, this doctrine has been conspicuous by its absence, and he, Paxton, called contemporary interest in the subject a, quote, soteriological gain of the 1960s. Now, soteriology, you know, is the teaching of what salvation is. That's what soteriology, I teach soteriology. That's the, that's the, the many cent word. But salvation, we would probably say. Zacherson quotes Paxton. Paxton, who wrote The Shaking of Adventism, that was a big book in its day, he said that this change, the sin question, that was a soteriological gain. Hey, thumbs up, it's a gain from the 1960s. QOD came out when? 1957 and was pushed for all it was worth in the years that followed. Interesting. In fact, Zacherson went on to write this about his own concern about uh, Andreessen and, and the issue of sin. Quote, in the 1960s, the present writer researched the published writings of M. L. Andreessen in an, in an effort to trace the effect of his rejection of original sin on his position regarding the moral nature of Christ. The study suggested that there was a direct correlation between his own conclusions and that his objection of the, to the 1957 Adventist statement on the nature of Christ in the book QOD stemmed from a reticence to appreciate sin beyond its actual nature. That's the loins of Abraham, Zacherson's book, page 11. Zacherson's understanding of sin, I believe, is mistaken. But he correctly sees a difference between approaches. On the cover copy for Zacherson's book, uh, he said, he makes this suggestion about original sin, quote, while not allegedly part of Adventist uniqueness, he's talking about original sin, it touches virtually every area of their theological thought. And so I believe today we need to take a look at QOD itself 
And there we're going to find confirmation that the QOD authors desire to incorporate a doctrine of original sin into Adventist theology, unfortunately, is confirmed. This is one thing they tried to do or wanted to do in the book. So, so um, well, it's easier to hold up with only the cover. <laughs> On page 383 of this, of this book, the authors of QOD, speaking of Jesus, uh, said this, and I'm quoting from this book, quote, he was without sin, not only in his outward conduct, but in his very nature. Subtle. But they assume here that you and I have sin in our very nature. And they exempt Jesus from this. In fact, the word exemption is exactly used in the book. Perhaps Elder Preby will speak to that in the next talk. But in doing so, what have they done? When they said that Jesus was exempt from our human nature, what do they do? They inescapably have exempted Jesus from our very nature at the same time. And I wonder if we have a Savior if we do that. Original sin is also indicated on page 22 and 23 of Questions on Doctrine with this categorical statement, quote, in common with conservative Christians and the historic Protestant creeds, we believe, here it is, that man was created sinless, but by his subsequent fall, entered into a state of alienation and depravity, unquote. Now, human alienation and depravity is here defined as a state of being. Did you catch that? But I want to contrast this with a little statement from Ellen White. This is in Heavenly Places, 194. I know you're going to ask. That's the quote, quote, uh, reference. So here's what Ellen White says. I think you'll listen closely. Quote, In our present fallen state, all that is needed is to give up the mind and character to its natural tendencies. In the natural world, give up a field to itself, and you will see it covered with briars and thorns. But if it yields precious grain or beautiful flowers, care and unremitting labor must be applied. Unquote. That's a little interesting quotation, isn't it? In our present fallen state, all that is needed is to give up the mind and character to its natural tendencies. So there's natural tendencies, and in our present state, if we give up to that, yes, we'll be in a, a bad situation, won't we? But she doesn't say we're guilty. She doesn't say it's a state of alienation. Do a search for it. You'll find the same thing. The descent to a situation of depravity and alienation is accomplished by choice. Did you notice that in that statement? You have to give yourself up to, those, to that, that, nat, that nature. By giving up the mind and character to natural tendencies. Not by being, but by choosing to be. That's how we come into a situation of sin and guilt. We are not born guilty. We're not born alienated. We are born damaged and we're born ready on a whisper's decision to become fully alienated. We're just not born fully alienated. Ellen G. White, Ellen G. White calls our situation in this quotation a fallen state, but she does not call it a state of alienation. Pa Pastor, aren't you splitting hairs? I wish I were. No, I don't think so. Let's zero in a little bit more now on this question of original sin. A few years past, I was rooting around, and I think you have the handout that has been handed, hopefully. Uh, I was rooting around in the Heritage Center in Loma Linda, and um, lo and behold, I came across a portion of a pre-publication draft for the manuscript of Questions on Doctrine. And you might have this one-page handout. By the way, if anybody's looking for some of the handouts we have tonight, uh, I think they're maybe putting it on the screen, but you can also get it at deerparkadventist.org, Pastor's Notes. These are all hanging there. And we'll have them on greatcontroversy.org in a few weeks, uh, my other website. But um, here's your handout. So uh, let's look at some of the things. Now, this is before they published it. So uh, we look at this, and what do we find? This is about 407 and 406 of, of QOD. Um, that's where this portion fits. So you'll see the phrase original sin on your handout, you'll see it four times. And in, in, this, in, the, in this draft, it's talking about the teaching of Romans 5.12. Now I hope you have your Bible and you might look at Romans 5.12 right now. Romans 5.12, and they say that Romans 5.12 is referring to original sin. Now let's read Romans 5.12. I think you remember the text. Wherefore as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. So that's what, that's what Romans 5.12 says. Now the draft in Questions on Doctrine says that, as you can see in front of you there, we, uh, it's, we're dealing with original sin here. And it's up and down the page, you can look at it. And you'll also see that there's something else in the QOD draft before it was published. 
Uh, a quote from Martin Luther. I want you to listen to this quote. It's very interesting. It's just a one line or so, um, but look at what it says. I think it is on your handout. Here's Martin Luther saying, and they were going to add this to Seventh-day Adventist teaching. This sin we bear as his children, Adam's children, and we are guilty on account of it, for with his nature, Adam also transfers his sin to all. Unquote. This was going to be in this book. Interesting find, isn't it? But what happened? What happened? Well, when QOD was published, the phrase original sin was changed to something a little bit more palatable for Adventists. Uh, Adam's sin is what's actually in here in the final version. The Luther quote was completely removed, and they had been received feedback. One feedback was from Raymond Cottrell. He reviewed the pre-publication manuscript, and he said, quote, This is the first I knew that Adventists believe in original sin, at least in the technical theological definition of the word. So there actually was some pushback. Uh, but Froome didn't do too well with pushback, but in this case they made an adjustment. But it's still there. Don't you think it's still there? And, and so it's still there. Now, did the change in the published version signal a real change in the understanding of the QD authors? I say no, it's still there. But, but why would they make such an aggressive effort to revise the, and, and reinterpret the long-standing Adventist teaching on Jesus' humanity? If they've changed it, if they really didn't put original sin in or have that in their mind anymore about QOD, why would they make this big effort to change the, the uh, Jesus, question of Jesus' humanity? Oh, now he has a nature of Adam before the fall. He, he only has, takes our nature vicariously. They've dropped that argument a long time ago. But these arguments are in the book. Uh, why do we have to make these changes? And you see, the issue is, which once you add the doctrine of original sin, you have a problem now with Jesus' humanity. Now you've got to protect his birth nature from guilt because that comes with original sin. So Jesus cannot have your birth nature or mine. Now we've got to protect him and surround him with uh, qualifying statements and whatever so that he's not considered to be guilty. Once you add this dogma, you have to make every effort to protect his birth nature from guilt. And you know what? I want you to be sure. In QOD, every effort is made. But we said that there are truths that are interlocked. And so follow me now, follow me closely. I know it's lunchtime, just finished, but try to follow me anyway. We say that these truths are interlocked. The nature of Christ's humanity is only one theological domino to fall. Once this dogma has been erected around Jesus, another shift occurs. Jesus has been, before, he's po both example and substitute, right? Now his example role is sharply diminished. Now it is alleged that his humanity is unlike our own. So we have to make an adjustment, you see. So now there's a shift in understanding Christ's work in the atonement process. Now he becomes primarily our substitute. Do you understand how that shift happens, logically? Other dominoes in the chain go down. The emphasis changes from God making holy and forgiving as companion features of, in the human salvation experience. Now his forgiving becomes almost exclusive and it also comes in terms really of a counted forgiveness. Obe obedience to God's law. It, now it's been determined to be impossible because of supposed continuous human guilt. So now obedience to God's law goes away. Now it becomes legalism. See how these pieces fit together? And then the behavioral standards go by the board and all of these things are interlinked. So we haven't even looked at points like the mark of the beast, the sealing, the close of probation, and that's a big one. If you change these pieces, you're going to have to change those pieces. And that's why today we have this situation. In the notes introduced in the Heritage Library re reissue of QOD, George Knight, they, they reprinted this book a few years ago, uh, and they came out with, added a bunch of notes from George Knight and some other scholars. They claimed in those notes that QOD did in fact misrepresent uh, Jesus, the Adventist view on, on uh, the nature of Christ. They said, we admit that. And that's a gain for us, isn't it? But they said on the issue of the atonement that really Andreessen and the QOD authors were really in about the same place, so they were kind of arguing over words. Well, but we see how these pieces all fit together, don't they? You change the human nature of Christ, you change the atonement. You change the atonement, you change the nature of sin, all these pieces all fit together in one piece. You can't just pull one out and it's all going to be just fine. They all are fitting together. So we have these changes and they really seem like they are uh, changes that have actually happened. Now, Emil Andreessen and the QOD authors were not really in agreement 
But the Bible's teaching on the atonement and on Jesus' humanity, they are closely intertwined. In fact, all the main New Testament texts, I don't know if you've ever thought about this, all the main New Testament texts that deal with the nature of Christ, they all talk about the atonement. Have you ever noticed that? Look at it. Think about those texts. The, you'll see all those texts. Romans 8. We heard some of that this morning. Praise the Lord. Hebrews 2. Philippians 2. Hebrews 4. Those texts all take us to the humanity of Jesus as our Savior and the atonement that Jesus makes. They fit together. You pull the pin on one, you're pulling the pin on the other. So you readjust one and the changes in the remaining t in two are logically entailed. You cannot make that change. The QOD authors had to modify all three or their theological system would be unstable. I'll let you think about that for just a minute. Have you been in the ABC lately? There are books in the ABC that uh, teach the emerging church things and there's books in the ABC that they've got great controversy there by Ellen White right next to it. Friends, we're talking about theological instability. Right. That's what's going on. And part of this goes back to QOD. It, is the modification of Adventist doctrine complete in QOD? No. Some changes in these doctrines were not fully attained. But how could it really have been otherwise? Remember, this had to pass a bunch of uh, uh, conference leaders and people. They had to be able to approve this. And it couldn't be so severe that they wouldn't approve it. But it had to be dramatic enough to convince the evangelicals. And so it was a give and take. So these doctrines are not all completely changed in QOD. Uh, but they sure, sure gave it a good try. Um, that doesn't make QOD any less nefarious, though, does it? So, yes, I call QOD nefarious today. Maybe well-intended, but nefarious at the same time. Many have thought that the Bible teaches original sin, but I want you to realize that the teaching of original sin really is a, was developed into its fullness between the 2nd and 4th centuries after the New Testament. And uh, the Bishop of Hippo, Augustine, he's the one that uh, pretty much developed this and the all pieces all came together with him. The core of this false understanding is, and I think we already know this, but as fallen humans, we are born guilty. That's really what it all boils down to. Involuntarily, we are born such that we are, at our essence, sin. We are sinning all the time. On the Sabbath, you're not keeping the Sabbath. It's God's holy day and you're keeping the day holy, but you're sinning all the day, all the time, because what? You're breathing? Yes. So we're said to have been in Adam when Adam sinned. And so you're born guilty of Adam's sin. We saw the Luther quotation. But before we've made then an even an intentional, morally informed decision, we're said to be guilty for the sin of another person. Does this create some issues for whether God is fair or not? I think it does. And so being guilty, the infant child is condemned and should he or she die before being baptized, what would happen to that little baby? The little baby would be lost. And so this is why Catholic parents are very keen to do infant baptism, baptize those little babies real quick because we don't want our little baby to be lost. I sympathize with that. But I don't believe that babies are born sinful. One uh, speaker I heard recently, an Adventist speaker, said that little babies are born, they're really little Hitlers. I don't believe that. I don't believe that. On the worst day, that little baby is not a little Hitler. That little baby is born with a damaged nature. Ellen White called it a fallen, in a fallen state, but it's not alienated from God. And God wants to bring the little children to him, but not, not by infant baptism. Let's not add that to the church. So once we introduce this doctrine of original sin, we have to protect the humanity of Jesus. Um, and we talked about that. So, well, we talked about original sin a little bit. Let's study our Bible and find out what does the Bible actually say about sin. Shall we do that? Yes. So let's go to Genesis chapter 4. And I, I warned you this was going to be fast moving. So Genesis 4, I think you know the story. Genesis 4, verse 6 and 7. Cain and Abel offer their sacrifices. God accepts Abel's offering, but he rejects Cain's offering. Cain becomes very angry. And then God pleads with Cain to do what is right and be accepted. God warns, and here's the quote. It's in Genesis 4, and look at verse 7. And if you, do not, if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door, and its desire is for you, but I'm using the NASB, that is, its desire is for you, but you must master it. So here's the first key teaching, one of the first key teachings on the Bible about sin. Cain and Abel, were they fallen nature or unfallen nature? 
fallen nature. Did God know that or did God forget? God knew it. What did God say to Cain? Hey you, you with the fallen nature, you that's thinking about murdering your brother, stop it. Stop now. Sin is ready to, it's like a predatory animal, it's ready to take you. He says, stop, you need to master it. You know the rest of the story, don't you? He rose up and slew his brother. Cain sees at this crossroads, he's on the point of sinning. But God says this, you've got to master this. The teaching about sin here is abundantly clear. Cain had grown up outside the garden. Cain knew about God's, uh, God's requirements. God's expectation for even fallen men and women is that they control themselves. And when God spoke to Cain, don't you think that was Jesus? Wasn't that our Lord Jesus talking to Cain and saying, Hey, stop now. Don't dwell on this thought. Don't think about this. But Cain did not answer the voice of Jesus. And Cain killed his brother. The Bible teaches sin must be overcome. Moving on, Deuteronomy 24.16. Deuteronomy, again, we're still in Moses. Deuteronomy 24.16. Another essential text for understanding sin. Here it is. We'll just go straight to it. Fathers shall not be put to death for their sons, nor shall sons be put to death for their fathers. Everyone shall be put to death for his own sin. Is this a confusing text? Is there anybody here that's confused about this text? It seems straightforward to me. We don't need a dissertation on this one. It's just as straightforward as it could be put in the Hebrew or in the English. Very simply, guilt and punishment come from personal sin. Nor, it, it's not sin that somebody else does, it's sin that you yourself are responsible for. Family bonds is between a son and a father do not extend to the death penalty. Sin is always personal. But let's keep moving. Ezekiel 18. And we could study the whole chapter, Ezekiel 18, with great profit, but the clock would undo us. And so let's just take a couple of lines here from Ezekiel 18, verse 20 through 22. Ezekiel 18. The person who sins will die. The son will not bear the punishment for the father's iniquity, nor will the father bear the punishment for the son's iniquity. The righteousness of the righteous will be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked will be upon himself. But if the wicked man turns from all his sins which he has committed, and observes all my statutes, and practices justice and righteousness, he shall surely live. He shall not die. All his transgressions which he has committed will not be remembered against him. Because of his righteousness which he has practiced, he will live. Are you encouraged when you read that? That is the Bible, what the Bible says about sin. The whole chapter is like this. You can read all of 18. The son is not punished for the father, nor the father for the son. And if a person behaving wickedly turns from his wickedness, this is important to us, isn't it? Because we've all behaved wickedly, and we've turned by the grace of God from our wickedness. If we turn from our wickedness, then God will give us life through Jesus. If, on the contrary, a person turns from right doing to wrongdoing, what's the result? And then you die in your sins. So Ezekiel makes clear this complete separation of sin from birth nature and the assignment of guilt based on only upon premeditated choice. Go, go straight on now to Psalm 51. Nothing stands still and by the time we come to uh, Augustine uh, we have uh, the church has traveled to the fourth century AD and there's one verse extracted from, uh, from Psalm 51 is going to be used and it's going to completely overwhelm the main Old Testament text we've looked at about what sin is. Psalm 51 we're going to forget all about Genesis 4, verse 6 and 7, and now we're all going to just kind of pile on at Psalm 51. And we're going to just look at one verse, Psalm 51, verse 5. So here's what it says there. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. This is the Old Testament key text on the doctrine of original sin. Right here. This verse is interpreted as meaning that David was born in sin and that he and we are born sinners. We are born guilty even in the first moment of conception we are in sin. I guess we're little Hitlers. But much is written in the same psalm exactly contradicting the idea of original sin. Have you ever looked at it? Look at it right now. Look at verse 1. Sin can be blotted out. Sin can be entirely removed. Can I do it? No. Can you do it? No. Can Jesus do it? Yes. The believer can be washed thoroughly, verse 2. He can be cleansed from sin. The sinner can be purified, verse 7. He can be cleansed, washed, he can be rendered whiter than snow. What's whiter than snow? David says that God can blot out in verse 9. God can blot out how many of his iniquities? All my iniquities. He can possess in himself a God-recreated clean heart. Notice how emphatic these are. Not just wash me, but wash me thoroughly. Thoroughly. 
Not just make white, but whiter than snow. Not just blot out my iniquities, but blot out all my iniquities, Jesus. And he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Consider now then again this carefully plucked line stripped of its context. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. What does it mean? What's the scope of that in verse 5? Because that's the key text. We need to think about it. Is the psalmist talking about maybe a sin in his parents? A sin in his mother? Uh, or is this a poetic emphatic statement in which David looks over his whole life and he sees his failures in, in darkest hue? Or is he making a statement about being born into a fallen situation? The statement would then be his recognition that all of us are born outside the garden all of us are born to parents who have exercised their free will in rebellion against God. We are part of an environment impacted by sin. It's true, isn't it? All are at risk of being killed or maimed by a drunk driver crossing the line, or stepping on a hepatitis C infected needle, or maybe a red light camera. These things are there. We added the red light cameras. But we only make ourselves guilty when we sin. It's not Adam. It's not David's mother. We personally choose rebellion against God, and that's how we become guilty of sin. David was born into this dangerous setting and then tragically sinned. His heart was broken, but he trusts that God that forgives authentic repentance, how merciful our God is, and how patient he is with us. Jesus is this exactly the Savior, Savior we want from sin. But now we keep moving. The New Testament, Romans 3, keep moving. It's interesting in Romans 3, uh, some people say we get a new doctrine of sin here, a new revelation. It's, a, it's an increasing revelation. So we're getting an improved de definition of sin as we go on into Romans 3. But what's interesting is that why doesn't Paul ever quote Psalm 51? Did you ever notice that? This is the key text, Psalm 51, shaped in iniquity. We just had it. Well, Paul must quote it five or six times. No, Paul doesn't quote it even one time. Completely absent. Never, I believe, never crossed Paul's mind because the Holy Spirit didn't mean for us to understand Psalm 51 5 that way so he never inspired Paul to think about it that way Does that make sense to you so if you look at Romans 3 look at verse 9 Paul says quote we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin now some people want to go in the next 10 verses Psalm uh, not Psalm Romans 3 verses 10 to 20 and look at those six quotations there and find a doctrine of original sin back there but you know what Paul says we have already charged verse 9 we have already charged that people are all under sin how is it that people are all under sin now we can't do this for time but remember this Romans 1 verse 17 through Romans 2 verse 14 look at it I'll just summarize here's how it runs the non-Jews know that there's a God and that they're operating in a morally charged environment. This is the argument of Paul. But while they know there's a God and that their actions have moral weight, they suppress that knowledge. They choose darkness. They place themselves in opposition to truth. Their understanding is darkened. God gives them over to what they desire and they finally worship and serve the creature. And that is how we become sinners. We all do it. Every person I'm looking at You've all done it. We all turn to the point where we worship and serve the creature. How is it that they worship the creature? It's by what they do, and it's by what you or I have done. That's how we became sin, involved in sin. Paul's view of right doing and wrong doing, Paul's view of sin and righteousness, it, unsurprisingly it's the same as Genesis 4, verse 6 and 7. Paul was a pretty good student of the scriptures, better than the authors of QOD, of course. Go through the passage, you'll see this, Romans 1 and Romans 2, we won't linger there. But I want you to notice, all are under sin because of chosen rebellion. All of us with our eyes open have chosen to engage in behavior that is opposite God, and thus with intention we have chosen to serve the creature rather than the, than the creator, and that's how we become guilty. That's how it happens. We don't need Adam's help. We have completely done it ourselves. We could spend some time looking at these uh, quotations in Romans 3, verses 10 to 20. I'm going to skip it. You look them up, though. It's an interesting study. There's about six of these quotations there. You can look in your margin and find the, all the psalms and places where those are quoted from. You know what you find there? Go back and look at each one. And usually pray, David is praying for deliverance, the, the, for the righteous from the wicked. Not a single one of those texts in your Bible tells us that we're born guilty. 
but all of us at different times because of our uh, chosen action have to have have been involved ourselves in those attitudes of the wicked, the attitudes of those who say there's no God, but that doesn't teach original sin in there. Well, let's keep rolling. Romans 14, verse 23, another text. Quote, But he who doubts is condemned if he eats, because his eating is not from faith, and whatever is not from faith is sin. And there it is. Whatever is not from faith is sin. So people will use this text and say that, okay, if you don't do it from faith, then nothing we really do is completely from faith, so therefore all the things that we do are sin. That's the way the reasoning goes. But notice what it simply says in the text. Each person is responsible to live out the faith that he has. Each is also responsible to behave in a way that does not weaken the faith of his brethren. Whatever actions a person engages in that do not arise out of faithfulness to God's will and the person's personal conscience, those are sinful choices. So our actions really are always actions of faith or actions of sin. We need to remember that, and whenever we act, we need to be acting from faith in Jesus. All of our actions have choice behind them. You say, well, but you're just talking about external actions. No, I'm not. There are external actions, and there are actions that are in your mind. You can't read my mind, but, you know, if I steal, you can see it. But if I covet, you can't see it, but it's a choice. It's an action in my mind to covet. All sins are choices, chosen, intentional choices, whether we can see them or whether they're behind the skin. So I want all my actions to be actions that flow from my faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. Ephesians 2 verse 3, we're still rolling. Ephesians 2 verse 3, Paul is describing the pre-conversion behavior of those who have later become believers. Before conversion, people acted in satisfying their lusts. And it says in the text, Ephesians 2 3, by nature, it talks about being children of wrath. You remember that text? By the way, this is used again in QOD. This is part of the argument that uh, we're born guilty. Well, look at the text, though. If you look at it, Ephesians 2, verse 3. Some take this to mean we're born guilty, but no one is condemned apart from the personal choice in Scripture. So think about it. Look at verse 1, Ephesians 2, verse 1. What were they dead in? What does it say? In their trespasses and sins which they had before walked in. Not Adam in their own sins. You see how that works? Verse 3 makes clear that these were chosen, intentional actions. They used to indulge these desires. They used to live in them. We are of such as that. We used to live in those ways. We've turned by the grace and mercy of God. There's a similar phrase in Ephesians 5, verse 6, in Colossians 3, verse 6. It only occurs those two, those two times in Scripture. Children of disobedience. That almost solves it right there. What is, what is it that it's the problem there? Disobedience. Chosen action. God's wrath comes upon children of disobedience. First there's a choice to disobey and then in consequence the wrath of God. Those engaged in disobedience have no inheritance in the kingdom of God. Sin behavior must change and can only change by God's power. Next in line, James 1, 13, 14, and 15. No, let no one say when he's tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he's carried away and enticed by his own lust. Then when lust is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. Well, God has no evil in himself, and he can't be tempted by evil. Nor does God tempt anyone. We learn it from the text. How then does temptation come? It is laid out pretty well right here. It arises when a person permits himself to center his affections on things that are forbidden. Then committed to his wrongly placed desire. In effect, he tempts himself. And this is really how we all sin. We choose to desire the wrong things. We become our own tempters. The devil gets us started, but we become his assistants. So to go from not sinning to sinning, it's a process. It's a series of choices, you see. First there's lust and wrong desire following the text. First there's lust, wrong desire. When wrong desire has been nurtured and becomes strong, the heart embraces it. It chooses the evil and then there's a choice to sin. And sin, if it reaches maturity, causes death. Wrong desire itself is not sin. There is a process of attaching oneself to wrong desire. If you choose it, if you play with it, if you keep playing with it, it's like glue that hardens. Temptation itself is not sin. Wrong thoughts, when they begin in our heads, can be rejected. They really can. We can choose not to do that. I want you to hear this note of encouragement from Ellen White. I'll give you the reference twice because I know you're going to ask. Southern Watchman, February 19, 1907. Quote, 
If we would not commit sin, and isn't that where all of our hearts are? If we would not commit sin, we must shun its very beginnings. Every emotion, every desire must be held in subjection to reason and conscience. Every unholy thought must be instantly repelled. By faith and prayer, all may meet the requirements of the gospel. None can be forced to transgress. Temptation, however strong, is never an excuse for sin. The eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. Cry unto the Lord, tempted soul. Cast yourself helpless, unworthy upon Jesus, and claim this very promise. The Lord will hear. He knows how strong are the inclinations of the natural heart, and he will help in every time of temptation. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness will be filled. Amen. Southern Watchman, February 19, 1907. If you have this understanding of sin that Ellen White does, would you teach original sin? Of course not. God can give us victory over all these things. Ellen White knew that, that God was mighty, that his arm is not shortened. And we need to know by experience as well. You can live without sinning. You can resist your own tendency. You can choose not to contaminate yourself. You see the elements, faith, prayer, self-control, resistance. None can be forced to transgress. That's what it said. Do you believe it? None can be forced to transgress. Sin is your own choice. Finally, 1 John 3, 4, the classic translation of 1 John 3, 4, says that sin is the transgression of the law. That puts emphasis at the question of choice. To sin is to intentionally choose to disobey God's revealed will. You're choosing rebellion. To sin is to be a rebel by choice to break God's law, to choose with intention to step across the line. And that's why this is a pretty good text to help us understand. What is sin? Sin is the transgression of the law. This verse, quoted perhaps more than any other, maybe it's the most straightforward text in all the New Testament, in a biblical definition of sin, and rightly so, because what does it do? It very simply echoes the description of sin that we see in Genesis 4, verse 6 and 7. It's just an echo. Sin is like a predatory animal waiting to pounce and slay us. If we are not proactive, our own wrong desires will master us. The choice remains with us. Will we choose self and sin, or will we choose Jesus and his righteousness? If there were time, we would profit from a consideration of the seal of God in the close of probation. For now, I'd like you to remember this. If men can be sealed, they won't sin. When probation closes before Jesus' second coming, men must not sin during the period that follows. The Bible says that believers can be sealed and that during that period they will not sin. But if sin is an essential part of human nature, if we are guilty for our fallen humanity, which we had no choice in being born into, the believer could never be sealed and could not be kept from sinning after the close of probation. Were the doctrine of sin and atonement introduced in QOD correct, our understanding of these end time components would have to be modified. Conclusion. Without QOD's change to the doctrine of sin, the modification of the positions on the nature of Christ and the atonement never could have been seriously attempted. You have to change the sin doctrine. But changes were attempted and the question is where is the Seventh-day Adventist Church today? We're kind of in this blurry halfway place, aren't we? A blurry halfway place. The QOD changes introduce theological instability. And again, I said you can see it when you go into your local ABC. The books containing conflicting theologies are side by side on the shelf. This isn't the way it should be. Amen. It's not the way it should be. Amen. Amen. But I have good news. The, listen to this. The natural gravity of Adventism is to match the testimony of the Bible and the writings of Ellen G. White. In other words, wherever we, what we tend to land on is always going to come back to the Bible and the writings of Ellen White. It's not going to come back to this. The natural gravity is to come back to this. Praise God. Amen. And so over time, things move. And in 1957, these, they were real excited about these new changes in this wonderful new book. Well, what finally happens though? We might not have realized it and it's probably an unappreciated fact, but I want you to notice that because of this gravity that I'm talking about, the church has settled itself on the understanding of sin. Amen. 
held before the publication of QOD. Remember I mentioned that quotation from our present fundamental beliefs at the beginning of, of the talk today? The fundamental beliefs of the church today in 2015 describe the same view of sin as that held by M. L. Andreessen, Alan G. White, and the early Seventh-day Adventist pioneers. This is good news. You see, the General Conference session voted statement of fundamental beliefs made clear that the larger church had not assimilated the QOD understanding of sin. In 1980, the church did not say that we sinned in Adam, but in the quotation, when our first parents disobeyed God, they denied their dependence upon Him and fell from their high position under God. The image of God in them was marred and they became subject to death. Their descendants share this fallen nature and its consequences. They are born with weaknesses and tendencies to evil. Our present belief statement. The rejection by the church of question, questions on doctrine, single most significant attempted theological change, foretells the eventual abandonment of these other viewpoints, the changes on the nature of Christ and the changes on the atonement. Is there time enough for those things to be changed back to the right place? Probably not. But if time were allowed to last and there were no other interventions, perhaps this, is, this would be where we would fall. We would come back to the gravity, back to where we normally would land. So the attempted revisions to Adventist Bible teachings on the atonement and the nature of Christ's humanity, those things, Froome and his associates at the height of their denominational influence, they were unable to bring enduring change to these core theological understandings of the church. There remain some who still view this, there's quite a few actually, of, sir, of pastors and, and some who still view these the topics through the QOD glasses that they were issued in seminary. But newer generations of Adventist pastors have no particular commitment to these changes from the 1950s. And you know what? They don't fit. They're not coherent. It's theological instability. We can back away from this. The church doesn't need to have these. But now I know some of you are thinking there's another part to this story. And some of you are thinking it by experience. There is another part to this story. Many have been treated roughly, yes, by some of my colleagues, some other pastors, and others who have made it their business to teach the QOD theological package. Sometimes our workers will actually go overseas, ordained Adventist ministers who are in current, uh, have current credentials and are completely qualified and ordained, and they will not be allowed to speak overseas on these topics we're talking about today. Isn't that something? It's the current belief of the church on the doctrine of sin here, but you can't preach it in certain parts of this world. In the Adventist church, exactly the place where God wants it to be presented. Amen. Some have been treated roughly. Some, for being faithful to pre-QOD views, have been removed from teaching Sabbath school class, removed from preaching in the pulpit, or maybe even asked not to be an elder anymore. Some have been treated worse than that. Over the decades of my ministry, I have received literally hundreds of communications from people who were trying to be faithful to the Adventism that they joined the church, to that Adventism that was there, but have been mistreated or set aside because their viewpoint wasn't the current one. And I'm sorry to hear of these things. I know about many of them. But I have a message for you, if this is what's happened to you. Take heart. The questions on doctrine, views on sin, the nature of Christ, and the atonement are, it's the, QOD, those views are theologically unstable. All three parts must be in place for the theology to hold together. All three parts are not in place. In QOD, that theology is unraveling today. This is where we are. We've re revisited the 1950s, we've looked at QOD, we've looked at the, what the Bible teaches on sin, and we've engaged in a study of those things, and where do we stand today? In conclusion, it's this. Since the church's understanding of what sin is has, has really not changed, God's church is free today to take the true understanding, the true shape, biblical shape of Adventism, and we're free to take that and we're to take it to the world and we're to do it today. Is everybody going to come along? No. Don't wait. Get on the bus and keep rolling. This message must go to every kindred nation, tongue, and people, and by the grace of God, it will. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you for your watch care over your church. You have not abandoned us. Bless and help your people. And Lord, may the word go and go and go until Jesus comes. We thank you for hearing our prayer, and we ask these things because of Jesus. In his name, amen.